Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Today we're going to look at the phenomenon of how genius can be needle-thin. Speaking loosely, we're going to talk about how a man can be a genius in one subject, and an idiot in another. Or even several other subjects. Or every other subject. Because we all intuitively understand physical talents, I'd like to begin with a physical metaphor. There is nobody who is an Olympic gymnast can bench press, squat, and deadlift over a thousand pounds, and can run a marathon in less than two hours and five minutes. It's not logically impossible that there could exist a man capable of all of these things, but there is a reason why in the comic books Superman came from a different planet. At the edges of human performance, you find people who are specialized. Their bodies are very good at one thing, but at the expense of other things. Now, the same sort of thing applies, but in a less obvious way, to the intellect. There is not merely one way of understanding everything in the world. Each thing must be understood according to its particular nature. Consider the difference between a biologist studying the mating patterns of deer and a mathematician proving that there are an infinite number of prime numbers. The biologist must track the deer, figure out where they go and when, observe when they change these patterns, and finally figure out where to set up to actually see the mating behavior. To succeed, such a biologist needs to be extremely patient, willing to sit still doing nothing for long periods of time, and cunning because he needs to be able to arrange a way to watch the deer without the deer knowing it is being watched. Intuition about how a deer thinks may well be the biologist's best friend, because guessing right is worth more than a thousand true, but useless, deductions. The mathematician, by contrast, stays at his chalkboard, working furiously until he comes up with an answer. He must ask himself what an infinite number of prime numbers might mean, as well as whether a finite number of prime numbers might lead to a contradiction. He must be impatient with not knowing. For him, intuition is worthless unless he can back it up deductively. Or take a third case, quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is largely a computational discipline in which its practitioners have given up trying to describe nature in anything but equations. This is not unique, historically. Until the age of telescopes, astronomy was largely just a computational trick to help astrology. One of the problems which quantum mechanics runs into is that equations which work well at large scales blow up in small scales. Forces can, according to the equations, go to infinity at very small distances. They don't actually do that in the real world, though. The way quantum mechanics have dealt with this is a process called renormalization, where at small scales portions of the equations are replaced with observed values. If this were described to the mathematician we were talking about earlier, it might well cause him to vomit, then burn the quantum mechanic at the stake. But renormalization works, and it's what's needed to do quantum mechanics. Each of these fields needs a very different sort of personality to excel. And moreover, the personality that would excel in one would actually do terribly in the other fields. And these are three broad fields I selected because we can see with very little description how different the researchers in them must think in order to succeed. But within a field, there are usually many subfields, each of which requires a different sort of person to do well in it. For instance, Einstein was brilliant at relativity, which pushed the limits of individual event predictive physics, but he couldn't make the leap to quantum mechanics, which discards the attempt to predict individual events and only predicts statistical distributions of events. Because he couldn't do it, the last several decades of his academic career had no publications of any great note. In fact, there's a very interesting discussion of this problem in Lee Smolin's book, The Trouble with Physics. The book is mainly about string theory, and in particular how it is accepted without evidence, but that doesn't concern us here. Along the way, he asks the question, why does science work? He cites a philosopher, uh, Paul Feyerabend, who asks that question and discards the common answers. Science uses a method! So do which doctors? Science uses math! So do astrologers. In fact, many astronomers were astrologers until recently. The answer he hints at, but never really states, is that science works, to the degree that it does, it is, after all, often wrong, because at each moment, given the current state of knowledge, many people are trying many things, and the person who has the quirks necessary to get lucky, gets lucky. Relativity is a very strange way of looking at the world, and Einstein was a very strange man. Quantum mechanics is also a very strange way of looking at the world, but it's strange in a different way, 
and men like Richard Feynman were strange in a different sort of way than Einstein was. Incidentally, if you ever get the chance to read Shirley or Joking, Mr. Feynman, I strongly recommend it. It's very interesting. Unfortunately, the follow-up, More Adventures of a Curious Character, wasn't nearly as good. The bit about the Challenger disaster wasn't bad. Anyway, what we have described is basically the idea of a talent, as we normally use the word in English. It means that a person is specially good at something, usually by being something of an odd shape. In physical talents, we rarely make the mistake of assuming someone very good at one thing is good at everything. People will ask weightlifters for help moving their furniture, but not marathon runners. But when it comes to intellectual activities, people make this exact mistake all the time. If someone is good at math, they are presumed to be good at arithmetic. Someone who has studied biology is presumed to know all of biology, and all of medicine. It's often the case that people who have studied any field are presumed to have a solid command of current events, recent history, politics, economics, literature, and in fact anything that the person asking wants to know. And of course we can see this in the field of scientist turned atheist preacher. I ran into someone on Twitter who literally was saying that all human intellects must bow before the grandeur of Stephen Hawking. Now, Stephen Hawking may well be an excellent physicist. There's no question whether he's good at manipulating equations, but so far as I know there's been no experimental confirmation of anything he's done. But he wrote an entire book based on misunderstanding what the word nothing means. It's not a difficult concept, and yet Hawking famously said, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can, and will, create itself from nothing. I only got a master's degree in mathematics, so I don't know how long it takes staring at equations to forget what the word nothing means. But there's a very simple test for whether you've gotten it right. If you can predicate something about it, it's not nothing. If a law of gravity exists, then a law of gravity exists. And so there's not nothing. What he talked about is nothing except for gravity. I can build a table out of nothing, except for wooden screws. I suppose that is fewer things than if I also needed a water buffalo. But nothing and nothing except for are unrelated concepts. No philosopher or theologian or ordinary man has ever asked, why is there something rather than nothing except for physical laws, which aren't operating on anything? Because that is a question so utterly bizarre that only somebody who has dedicated his life to trying to answer really bizarre questions would ever think that this might possibly be a reasonable question. And there is, of course, a feedback mechanism. An unusual person, self-selected for an unusual field of study, will become more unusual as his mind wraps ever further around the strange questions he contemplates. This is why in the old universities, people had to study all the same subjects in their undergraduate years. It broadened them out and kept them from becoming too narrow. There are, I think, several reasons for this common mistake. And there is, of course, the obvious one that people want authorities, and deprived of real authorities, will nominate the most likely person they can find, however badly suited that person really is to the task. Human beings did not evolve in, and were not meant for, a world full of narrow specialists. So the things which would be a suitable proxy for wisdom, and the clear understanding of something hard to understand, used to work much better. Equally responsible, but far less obvious, is the relationship of reputation to authority. Far too many traits in this world look like other traits, if all you have to go on is a few words. Even a few thousand words can be highly misleading. Just look at how many young women mistake bad boys for strong and confident men when in fact they're weak and needy men. Standing against society can come from having a spine, but it can also come from having weak legs and needing to stand against something to remain erect. To make the metaphor a little more explicit, you can be so much for something that you will defy the mass of humanity, but you can also be so little for anything that the only reason you can find for getting up in the morning is to piss off the mass of humanity. Throw in a pretty face and too many people will mistake the act as coming from virtue, not vice. On the flip side of that, you'll find the idea that women aren't interested in nice guys. Just like there are damaged men with terrible judgment, there are damaged women with terrible judgment, but by and large, women are perfectly interested in nice guys. It's just that the niceness must come from a place of strength, not weakness. It is perfectly possible to politely tell somebody that they're wrong. It is perfectly possible to politely be unintimidated and not care what another person thinks. Niceness which comes from a place of strength is quite appealing. 
and while niceness that is merely a defensive posture to protect weakness is quite unappealing. Consider the famous scene from The Avengers, where Black Widow tells Captain America to sit out the fight with Thor, Loki, and Iron Man. I'd sit this one out, Cap. I don't see how I can. These guys come from legend. They're basically gods. There's only one god, man. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. No one, including Black Widow, respects Captain America any less because he politely told her that he had to do his duty and couldn't cower in fear. And the very fact that the clearest example I could go for was a fictional example speaks directly to my point. In real life, it's very rare that there is a compelling reason to jump out of an airplane to fight people with mystic powers. Proving that politeness comes from virtue and not vice is generally the work of a vast quantity of small evidence. That is, it can only be known by knowing someone for a long time. And this knowledge is, to a degree, transitive. If you've known me for many years, and I've known my friend for many years, you will, largely, accept my vouching for my friend, especially if he isn't around at the time when I do it. If I tell you that he's a smart man, or an honest man, you will likely trust him, and rightly so. If I tell you not to pay too much attention to all of his assertions, you'll probably not trust him, and again, rightly so. The modern world is largely missing all of this information. This is especially the case in public discourse, where people appear out of nowhere and disappear again with extraordinary rapidity. No one knows anyone, and worse, no one knows anyone who knows anyone. There isn't even a general consensus on anyone. But actually, that's not quite true. And here we come to why actors, sports figures, and scientists often get a vastly disproportionate share of deference. Everyone agrees that science in the abstract is a marvelous thing, and that many scientists are doing good work, and that some scientists have advanced the state of human knowledge of the natural world. Everyone has at least a guardedly positive opinion about scientists in the abstract, Catholic and Protestant, religious and irreligious, Democrat and Republican. Everyone thinks that scientists probably aren't idiots. There are, of course, massive problems with this when applied to particular cases. Any particular scientist might well be an idiot, even within his own field. But to paraphrase Jane Austen, Desperate people are not always wise, and people hungry for some sort of universally respected authority will take what they can get. This is also why everyone liking football players and actors will make the especially gullible care what athletes and actors have to say about politics. Universal approbation, especially when linked to a pretty face, can easily trigger the instinct for deference. That's all for now. Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.